Welcome to a Lunch with Biggie, a podcast about small business and creatives sharing their stories and inspiring you. My guest today is an Orlando-based artist, illustrator, muralist, as well as the creator of the graphic novel series Very Near Mint and the new comic series The Unbelievable Floridians. Please welcome baseball nerd and tiki enthusiast Justin Peterson. What's going on, Justin? Not much, man. What's going on with you? Thank you for that introduction. You're very, very welcome, man. Very, very welcome. What? So obviously we're at during lunchtime. What's your usual go-to lunch uh, or favorite sandwich type thing? My usual go-to lunch is uh, probably like a peanut butter sandwich and unfortunately finding my way to a bottom of a bag of chips, like okay. too many chips, more more chips and sandwich, but always like peanut butter, never jelly, just always peanut butter and uh, like uh, uh, potato roll bread. What kind of, uh, what kind of chips? Uh, varies. I u- really like the Lay's baked barbecue. Okay. I know barbecue is a divisive chip for some, but I, th- that, that barbecue chip from Lay's, the baked ones are the best in my opinion. What about how often or have you ever chips inside the peanut butter sandwich? That's I've, you know, I think my dad did that growing up and I've certainly seen my friends do that with like Fritos and, mm-hmm. uh, the, uh, what were the, um, potato sticks oh yeah yeah they would do that like on ham sandwiches and Mm -hmm. stuff not not my thing necessarily i love crunchy stuff and i feel like i should put chips inside my sandwich but when i'm having peanut butter though it's a little hard you know so it's funny because you said that and the one the only thing i could think of if you're gonna do that would be like the dill pickle because i know that's like a Mm -hmm. popular some people like the you know that's peanut butter pickle not a bad idea that's the one i kind of i thought of but yeah so peanut butter for lunch but if i'm you know out and about uh my favorite like you want my favorite uh like brand or like sure whatever you want to give me the number six jersey mike's roast beef on white bread uh with american cheese not mike's way just a little lettuce a little uh oil salt and pepper and we're good to go okay no that's a good one that's a that's a that's a good one locally though i mean yellow dog come on yeah yellow dog eats is of course that's a great one as well can't definitely can't go wrong with that so I've known you for many years and uh, and I and I'm super excited because I've I've always wanted to talk to you about kind of like your creative process and all that stuff. I think we actually I'm almost positive. I don't know if you remember or not when we ever met. I think the first time we met was actually at a Megacon. Um, we may have been I may have been following you on social media. And I think that's when I actually got to meet you. OK. Was at a Megacon. I don't remember the the big joke about uh, with my wife and I about conventions is I can't remember a damn person that and comes nor, to the table. And nor should you. I have a uh, up there on my lanyard. I have a little uh, uh, button, little pin that says "Hello." I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Yeah. <laughs> there and and do you? And out of curiosity, are you good with names or bad with? Oh, names? I'm horrible with names. Absolutely horrible with names. Do you and Aaron? Do you and Aaron have a pro, uh, kind of a protocol? Oh yeah, absolutely. So uh, she'll, you know, if she sees me just go blank, she'll interject and be like, "Oh hi, by the way, I'm Aaron." And then they'll be like, "Hi, nice to meet you." And it's like, "Oh come on, man, you got to give us your name. Give that, us your name." I, I I needed to ask that question because I'm I tend to be horrible with names. Yeah. And obviously, people remember Biggie. Yeah. So it's a lot easier to kind of remember that. And then a lot of times, I tell my wife, if I, I'm like, and I even taught my daughter this now. If I don't introduce you, introduce yourself, introduce yourself. Yes. And let's just see. And then that way I can be like, or I do remember them. And the worst was when, when they're like, hi. And then I'm like, I'm like, oh, honey, do you remember? And then my my wife's like, no, I have no idea who this person is. And I was like, what I love about comic conventions, you know, they, everyone thinks you're their friend and and that's great i i want to i i'm i want to be friendly and open to everyone that comes to the table but they forget probably that it's been a year or more since i've seen them last and it's not the only show that i did that year so they're one of a thousand or two thousand people that i'll talk to over the course of a year yeah and uh yeah it gets uh yeah i can't i like I can't keep that stuff in my brain. No, no, nor should you. Nor should you. Okay, so let's <laughs> so let's talk. So let's talk a little bit about like all the different things that I mentioned that sure. you do. So yeah. obviously, I know you, w- one of the big ones. I know that you for a long time were doing. Uh, you were doing like you were doing a muralist. You were doing a lot yes. of different murals. Yep. Um. So how did all that come about? Like, how did you? 
Like, how did that process go? Because you kind of, you've been basically did it, I guess, in the last, like, what is it, like maybe 10, 11 years? You've been, you've done with like two of the larger Central Florida, um, I guess, Central Florida based companies yeah. that now have exploded. Yes. Um, Jeremiah's and Tijuana Flats. Correct. And, um, and you've done, I think if, I think if I, and you may, you obviously, you know, the number probably better than I do. I want to say you've done about 170 murals or so in the last 11 years. I would, it's, I actually think it's probably at this point closer to 210, 225. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I started with Tijuana Flats. They found me in 2000. Oh man. I want to say it was like late 2007. I was posting artwork on, and this will be a throwback to the older listeners in the crowd, uh, live journal. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I even had Facebook at that point. I was on MySpace and I had live journal. I was using live journal as my sort of my, uh, uh, gallery or just, you know, blog posting. Right. So I drew a comic about me and my friends eating at Tijuana flats one night. And then that we also went to go see, uh, the 3d U2 concert, okay. uh, U2 3d, I think is what it was called. And, uh, anyway, so I posted that online, I think probably Friday night or Saturday morning or something like that. Then Tuesday or month or Monday or Tuesday that following week, I had an email from Tijuana flats. And I was like, Oh man, they're going to tell me to take it down because I'm using their, you know, brand in this comic or whatever. And the email says, we've been following your artwork. We love what we see. Can we talk to you about doing murals? I was like, oh, okay, sure. So I had a meeting with them. And the first thing they asked is like, you can paint murals, right? I was like, oh, of course I can paint murals. And I had never, <laughs> never, painted. <laughs> never painted a mural. In <laughs> fact, in fact, the joke is that I really hadn't painted much in college even. I went to school for animation, so there wasn't really a lot of things I had to paint. So I think it would probably have been at that point at least five years, a solid five years before I, I'd be, since I picked up a paintbrush and paint. So I agreed to it. I was like, yeah, absolutely, I can do this. And then I got my first uh, gig. It was like near Thanksgiving of 2008 and it was down to fort lauderdale and it took me two weeks to do that mural and it was probably 25 feet wide by 10 feet tall and in retrospect that's a very small mural compared to what i would eventually start doing for tijuana flats and then eventually for jeremiah's and uh yeah so i think i did close to 120 125 murals for tijuana flats between 2008 and 2016 wow yeah how long does it take you now? How long would something like that take you now, the 25 by 18 now? Oh, well, 25 by 18 or even bigger. Yeah. Usually, I can, I've can. i got it down to about 18 hours. I was going to finish. say, I, I was going to say, because I, I follow you closely enough to, to see that you kind of knock them out almost like in a weekend. Like you can go oh, somewhere. Oh, yeah. Well, a, would, I mean, uh, if you're, you know, a Central Florida person or even if you're listening in Texas or out yeah. there in Arizona or, you know, anywhere here in the Southeast, Jeremiah's is exploding. Like they, they started franchise right before covid and they went from having like 20 locations just here in orlando essentially to uh they're aiming for 500 over five years wow so uh i know i i just recently last year did their hundredth store like did the mural for the hundredth location and they're well beyond 100 at this point so uh but yeah eight sixteen four like i would say like really like a 20 by 10 mural i could probably do that in 10 hours start to finish when you when you do something like that when you're like when you deal with doing that many murals are there certain obviously i know there's like you know uh, all major corporations and anything properly branded they have you know certain things that they want to have is there is there how much freedom does it get do you like how's that process that creative process when you're doing a, a mural is it one of those where like the the owner of the of the franchise will say i wanted this themed or are you researching those locations to kind of include some of those elements like how does all that kind of work it's honestly a little of column a a little column b and a little column c there is mandates from corporate just like there was from tijuana flats that there are certain aspects that uh like branding that they want on the wall right they want the frog character scoops they want the slogan live life to the coolest and then there's the hand holding the gelati which uh for those not listening a gelati is just a layering of italian ice and and soft soft serve ice cream delicious it's pretty good it's very good actually and so those three are mandates on most of the murals depending on space obviously and then everything else i get to fill in sometimes the franchisees just don't care they're like whatever man do whatever you want to do it's totally cool i'm like great whatever and then some people have a very specific idea of what they want 
and then uh, mostly they want to highlight the community in some sort of way. So it's always easy when it's a cool town and there's some landmarks or historical things that you can pull from. But when you're kind of up in the panhandle, yeah, uh, uh, there's not a lot up there, yeah. you know, like, so it was a struggle in some locations and, uh, and sometimes it was just super easy. Like I, I've never drawn as many cows and horses and, uh, farm things as I did when I we were doing stores out in Texas. And then, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, it seems like on the coast, both east and west coast of Florida, it's a lot of like, oh, we want the beach. And it's like, okay, well, it's going to look like one of the other murals because there's only so many ways yeah. I can make a gelati wave look like the beach. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> so yeah, I, w- I I work with I work closely with the franchisees and corporate. Uh, or I did. I'm, I'm not with them anymore. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I would work hand in hand with them to make sure that they got what they were looking for. But I, I had a lot of creative freedom inside the parameters um because i mean they're not artistic so yeah. they're just going to be happy with anything that looks great on their wall correct and it's it's for me it was interesting because obviously since i fought fo- i've been following you for so long it would be fun when i would when i would go to different tier one flats mm-hmm. and i'd be able to look and be like try to see because you have a you do have a certain style um uh, i would say and, and so i'm kind of curious like where where like what has influenced your style of art um, well, you, first of all, you're not the only person who would like go like on Tijuana flats tours and yep. find murals. Like I, there's so many people who are like, Oh man, I've, I've gone to 25 stores. I'm like, that's too much Tijuana flats, dude. Yeah. Like no, no one needs that much, you know? Correct. Correct. Well, the crushed me, ice is good. Uh, anyway, so to answer your question though, about like style and where my style came yeah, yeah. from, I mean, I've been drawing, uh, since I was like two years old, uh, and I grew up obviously like everyone else watching Saturday morning cartoons. And when I was in middle school, I got introduced to Mm X-Men and uh, fell down the rabbit hole of comics really hard. But simultaneously I grew up and you can see we're sitting here in my studio that I've got the entire collection of uh, peanuts, uh, Calvin and Hobbes and uh, zits. So comic strips were very influential to me in uh growing up and you know kind of shaping my style and then yeah a lot of the x-men artists uh throughout middle school and high school kind of molded me i figured out pretty early on that i couldn't draw realistically i didn't care for anatomy or uh perspective or anything like that so i was like well what can i get away with and it's like well charles schultz he draws on a 2d plane all the time right he's not he doesn't care that snoopy's doghouse doesn't make sense yeah and uh same thing with like wild cards you know just wacky cartoons right they don't care about perspective or you know uh uh, you know changing your eyeline or whatever so um i just started pushing myself when i was in college and um you know i really developed this style i think a lot of people would consider it or classify it as like almost graphic designing in some ways especially the murals because of the bold colors and bold lines it's very angular Mm -hmm. Uh, my friends own a brewery out in tampa and they want to name a beer after me called square fingers because every oh yeah you love your square i love i I don't you know there was one franchisee for jeremiah's who insisted I draw a different hand holding that gelati. And she was like, that's not what a hand looks like. I'm like, well, that's how I draw hands. <laughs> and she's like, that's not, no one's hands are squared off. I'm like, well, okay, I'm sure. But there's also, you know, you have a frog eating ice cream on the mural too. Like we're yeah. going to get hung up on yeah. squared <laughs> fingers. So <laughs> anyway, but uh, yeah, and you know, I, I just really cartoons comic strips and way too many x-men comics shaped my style no i I get that so i used to collect comic books as well so i kind of i was like a huge i didn't like to read but i loved reading comics sure that was like my whole thing i read all these different things and i i will say that as i got older i kind of stopped uh, all my comics were at my parents' house, and I just kind of stopped collecting. And then I decided I wanted to go to MegaCon. And when I got, when I saw you, and I saw the very near mint uh, series that you started, um, and I basically was like, that was like the first thing that got me back onto comics. I'm uh, sorry, and yeah. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, I didn't realize how expensive it is afterwards. Well, that's besides the point because my favorite series that I still own and still have is very near mint. And I kind of want to talk about it because, um, I think it's such a great, uh, a great series. And I want to kind of know a little bit about how you kind of came up with it because the other big thing was you actually, like it's, you printed it. It's like a printed. Oh yeah. No, it's a real, it's a real book that you can hold in your hands. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. You can 
put it on your shelf or set it on fire. It's made with real paper. As long as you buy it. As, you long, can do as, long, as, you, as long as you buy it, you can do whatever Heck you yeah. want with it <laughs> at the end of the day. So, yeah, the uh, the backstory on Very Near Mint um, uh, is I had those characters kind of created when I was in high school. Um, they were sort of back then based on me and my friends. And uh, when we were in high school, that was like the height of Seinfeld. And I wanted to kind of just do a comic that wasn't like anything else I was seeing on the shelf, especially down in Cape Coral, where we didn't really have access to uh, indie comics. So I wanted to do kind of a comic about nothing with just some high school friends hanging out. And it was just a way to, like, you know, draw my friends and you know, impress girls or whatever in high school. And then I held on to those ca- characters uh, through college, and I would put them in some of my animation projects and uh, the uh, storyboarding projects. And then I got out of college and... And, you know, I got the muraling job with Tijuana Flats a few years after college, but I was still calling myself a comic book artist. I was not calling myself a muralist because truly I wanted to just be a A comic comic book book artist. artist. But when people would be like, all right, great. Where's your comic? I'd be like, "Uh, better make one, I guess. So I did the very first version of Very Near Mint. I think it was late 2007, if I'm not mistaken, or early 2008. And it was just like a 20 page comic. And I had it at Megacon. And it was the only thing on my table. And it was, it was really sad looking at it now because as you've been to MegaCon a million yeah. times where these print walls and print towers and everyone's got a million things on their table. I literally just put out like five to eight copies of Very Near Mint at any time. And I think I was like thrilled when I sold probably like 14 or 15 of them during the weekend. And so I sat on that book for a couple years and I was still calling myself a comic book artist but I still wasn't drawing any more of this book. So I had like a come to Jesus moment uh, about 2010 when I was, you know, I had all this money or not money. It wasn't the money. That was the thing. It was the freedom with Tijuana flats. I was working like, you know, once every three to five weeks doing a mural. So I had a lot of free time and I was like, well, if you're going to do comics, you should do comics now. Like this is the moment. If you're not going to do it, stop calling yourself a comic artist or whatever. So it was, At that same time, call it kismet, I guess, that Kickstarter started, essentially. So I was able to raise the funds for the first book. And um, yeah, that's kind of the story. Like at that point, that was one of the more successful Kickstarter comics that had been put on the the platform. I was invited to their headquarters when I was in New York for a comic convention. And back then, it was legitimately just a room with a long table and maybe like 15 or 16 people working there. And they were like, man, you made so much money. Like I made like four thousand dollars, guys. Like it's not that much. I made enough to print books, and uh, but yeah. So between twenty ten and twenty fourteen, I did five hundred pages of very near mint. It ended up being three different volumes, and did Kickstarter projects for all of them. And then now I have a collected version of all of it with a lot of stuff that uh, you know, some sketches and stuff from that I had in high school of the characters and the older stories. And so I still uh, haul that around with me to conventions and. Uh, the plot just so if anyone's listening is interested it's yeah. about two guys who own a comic book shop and then colin and sam and then one day they look outside and there's a rival comic book shop that is literally opened up across the street called across the street comics and that's where the plot starts and i can't give you any more details because it's all spoilers from do, there on out do the main characters i know and i know i've read and i and i've seen that you've kind of talked about how there's going going to be kind of like another kind of in within the universe so is it the same two characters oh yeah so going in into the next next iteration of very near mint yeah so you know since i finished volume three the only thing that people really want to talk to me about at conventions is where's more very near mint i'm like yeah. guys i don't know if i have any more story to tell with these characters like 500 pages is a lot yeah. for anything let alone like squeezing that juice out of that story like there i don't i didn't think i had much left it uh, turns out i have some stuff left that I ha- i've had ideas over the last few years especially during the pandemic uh being able to you know the trick is i guess maybe we can get into this later about the creative process but no, when, I, when i'm driving yeah. like my brain unlocks like i'm able to write when i'm driving so like i do a lot of dictation on my phone while i'm driving not like listening to podcasts or music i will write an entire graphic novel when i'm driving from orlando to like uh new orleans doing a mural like by the time i get to new orleans i have a book written okay hold on so let's this is i love i love this okay Uh, this is great so 
So do you listen to music? You're not listening to music then. Well, I'll, you know, it, it's not, I can't say yeah. that it's every time that correct, it happens. Correct, and, correct. you know, I'll start the drive listening to music and then, you know, I'm so familiar with all the interstates and just the length of the, like I was driving out to Texas a lot for those Jeremiah's. My gosh. And so, you know, it's you and the road in 16 hours. And, uh, there's only so much U2 and smashing pumpkins that you can listen to before you're like, all right, I just need to listen to the road or, or, you know, call my mom or something. And so usually in those moments, like, or, you know, just when you're driving, I'll have an idea pop up. I'll think about it. And then, yeah, if, like I'll just start talking to myself into my phone. How when you? I'm curious. What what are you using? Are you using like just a memos? The, no, just like the or notes you app. Literally, or are you literally telling like Siri, make a note of this? No, you, so I'll I'll open up the notes app and uh, just you know start the dictation and just let it run, and then I'll go back and edit it later because obviously I you know there'll be periods of me cursing at bad driver correct yeah. <laughs> so i'll need to edit that stuff out yeah. but yeah no i'll just i'll dictate until i have uh until i have enough like um for instance so the yeah the there's more very near mint coming and you can see the script there on my cork board yeah uh that was written in like 10 hours as a dictation uh on the way to a mural in new orleans that's that's awesome yeah yeah. That, that is absolutely awesome. The other big thing that you did in between, because I know you have a, a new series. Yes. Um, you created a character, and I'm kind of curious a little bit about the character. Um, it's the hot dogger. <laughs> yeah. Um, he kind of has, it's kind of, like, obviously, I feel like he's like a Batman in a hot dog uniform. That's so and, exactly it. Yeah, right? And so then my question is, where, where did that come from? And two, uh, are, are we going to see more of him? So, okay. So Hot Dogger, yes, is Batman essentially in a hot dog costume. Uh, the guy's name is Chuck Coney. Uh, he owns a hot dog food truck called uh, Wiener and Still Champion. And So good. Uh, the, I, so I think I had the title first. I think I Hot Dogger, I, had, I was like Hot Dogger. What do I do with that? Hot dogger. That sounds good. And uh, it was for MegaCon 2016. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now very near mint at this point, the last book, book three, would be two years old. And I'm back in that same spot I was in 2010. I'm calling calling myself a comic book artist, but I don't have anything new. So I had nine days before the convention started. And I did the cover. Well, I wrote it, drew it. And got it printed in seven days. That's insane. Well, well, I guess the full nine days. Like the first two days of that nine days, I wrote it, uh, figured out what the character design was, and then drew it. And then I literally got the book in hand the morning of the convention. Like I drove out to Tampa because I was working out in Tampa. I got it printed from the printer that we were using for our company, picked it up and brought it home, and then was sold it. Like it was, there was nothing fresher at that convention like that was the newest thing possible wow so more but to answer your question now hot docker unfortunately is six years seven years old uh you know and people now ask me just like very near mint where's more hot dog the answer is it's finally coming legitimately i have book two written i've have the first page drawn on my ipad uh the book will be out for heroes con in june and uh, North Carolina. I laugh because um, I remember when the comic came out, I got it. I, I, I own it. And I remember going, please tell me there's going to be a sandwich guy. Uh, and and yeah. <laughs> that was like one of the many questions I had. I was like, there's going to be, I'm like, is there going to be a condiment king? In here? <laughs> <laughs> so I actually think I have condiment king written down in one of my notes for like the books and stuff. But um, the real thing that I wanted to do with the comic very near mint before I did a slight edit on it, taking it out, there was, mild cursing right like i would say it's like pg-13 there's no nudity or like yeah. extreme violence or anything like that but there was cursing you know they're just i i wrote it as how i talk um so i wanted to have you know people parents would come up and say is this uh, uh appropriate for a child and i'd be like well a 13 year old probably i mean the the content's not really like is a yeah. six-year-old care about comic book shops and yeah. rival comic book shops and you know uh rob liefeld jokes like that's that's meant for a very specific audience so i was like well i need to have something meant for kids so yeah when i had the title hot dogger i was like well okay let me design this in the way that it feels like one of those manic 
Cartoon Network shows. I wanted it to have a real cartoony feeling to it. Not just not the style of the art specifically, but the way that the book moved. Like I didn't want to get bogged down in details. Like, yeah, he's a guy who has hot dog powers. What does that mean? I don't know. Yeah. He has the proportional strength of a hot dog because he got, you know, splashed with radioactive hot dog water. I don't need to explain it any more than that. Yeah, like if it. you don't get it. I, I don't know it, you yeah. know, like who knows? And so I just wanted to be completely off the rails weird. And it was, uh, I achieved that goal. And it also helped that I was, you know, drawing, uh, probably two pages a day, three pages a day for six straight days to get that thing done. So I was losing, like, I was kind of like out of my I was mind, delirious. Too, a little delirium yeah. to help make it happen. So, uh, yeah, I don't remember where I was no, going with that. That's, that's a good. That's good. Yeah. Um, and that kind of leads then to your your newest series. And obviously, yep. uh, before I go there, I, I want to ask the question of like, so if you could have a superpowers, what would be your superpowers? Uh, I think probably teleportation. Uh, I'm afraid of heights, so I don't want to fly. Uh, and I like to go places, so I have to, you know, put up with being in an airplane. But if I could just be in hawaii come on yeah it's pretty awesome come on i mean i love my delta sky miles but you know just get me there yeah no i get that i know and i know you've been you're inspired by 90s um x-men comics yes. uh so tell me a little bit about how you came up with the idea of the unbelievable floridians so it's kind of a two-pronged thing one i had an idea for a long time of just doing a straight up bootleg x-men comic like picking uh, a storyline from the 90s and like literally drawing a comic in between the moments uh or finding like there's a oh they they there's like a month gap from this story to this story or something right like what did they the characters do in that moment so i really wanted i that was the initial thought do just and make it as legitimate looking as possible. I wasn't going to sell it because I mean, obviously there's some gray area there, right? Like it shouldn't really be selling yeah. X-Men comics. More importantly, my wife works for the mouse. So I didn't really want to, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't need to be the guy who's getting sued for drawing bootleg X-Men comics while my wife works in Correct. HR at Disney. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought better of that idea. Smart. I put it on the back burner. I thought maybe it could still be maybe like an online thing for Instagram or whatever, not sell it or whatever. Anyway, Around that same time, I got um, contacted by a comic convention down in Miami, uh, Florida Supercon, and they asked, they liked my art, and they wanted some Florida-based superheroes to put on their website and for some of the signage and stuff inside the uh, uh, convention center. And so I started coming up with some sketches, and I don't know if I should be telling this story, but it's too late now. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can edit it. No, no, totally no, no, take no, no, it's totally fine. The, the first sketch I did was this orange character. Yeah. And I looked at it and I'm like, I can't give them this orange character. Like, I just can't give them this character. Like, I can give them a bunch of Florida-based characters. But, but this, it's not this guy. But it cannot, whatever I do, it, I have to hold on to this character. It's an orange with arms and legs. He had a mask, a little utility belt He's on. He's badass. And the first thing, like, I didn't know what to name him. So the sketch says, Kid Citrus. And I was like, I don't know what I'm ever going to do with that character. I'm going to put him in my back pocket for another day. And uh, I'll just, you know, keep creating some characters for uh, this convention. And they had some things that they specifically wanted. So I gave them what they wanted and I got paid and everyone's happy. And I don't think they use that art anymore anyway. So uh, flash forward to uh, Thanksgiving two years ago during COVID. I was up in Indiana with uh, my uh, in-laws and my uh, wife and um, kind of had like a week off just not doing anything and I banged out the script for the first issue like I wanted to do like X-Men but I had I was like what if I just do Florida based characters instead of X-Men right like they can just all be X-Men but with really crappy Florida superhero power so <laughs> and again I was trying to just be get in that mindset of what I did for Hot Dogger which was dumb and no explanation like don't explain it like it's better just let people use their imagination and stuff so I, I had Kid Citrus the orange character and then I was like all right Skunk Ape uh, which is for, for sure. people who aren't listening, who aren't in Florida. That's our Bigfoot who lives in the Everglades. Yep. So have Skunk Ape. He's like the beast type Wolverine character. Then I need a Cyclops character, someone who's a little stuffy. 
Uh, so I was like, all right, well, sunshine, you know, it's hot here. Well, okay, how about a guy who got too many UV rays down in the Florida Keys and just burst into flames and he can't turn it off? I'll call that guy Sunburn. I'm like, I need a hurricane character, obviously. So I uh, gale force, just a storm, the storm yeah. analog. Um, and then I wanted a cable slash bishop character. And I was like, okay don't want it to just be like a guy who's from the future or something like what i need another weird thing here i'm like well alligators so i made it a half gator half man from the a possible near future who's come back in time to stop whatever again i'm being as vague as possible in the comic because i don't really know like yeah. i don't know why who knows i don't even, what i know about x-men is that they don't know what they're doing so i don't have to know what i'm doing either Correct. ultimately and then i needed a professor x character so i uh uh love the idea of a dolphin wearing a suit inside a tank and the tank almost you know it's like called the think tank and he's has wheels on the tank and he's just being driven around he's a telepath because he's underwater so he can't yeah. talk and dolphins are obviously super smart so it just fit the characters and yeah so i just got down the work and uh needed a, a villain for the first issue and uh central florida what what's one of our biggest uh, villains here sinkholes so uh like mole man from fantastic yep. four or you know just kind of like a gross you know just a gross character that they could beat up and that no one would really be sad about yeah uh, you know if they beat him up too bad so and that's how it really started it started with me drawing an orange and then now i have a really dumb x-men analog comic called the unbelievable floridians but now it's you know it's great i love it i think that they, it's super great the way the the covers are the way uh i got issue zero mm-hmm. uh i look forward to reading issue one and uh and i think it's something you can actually totally build on which is uh which is the great thing about it. Yeah, so you know, not to give too much away, but I guess now I'm in the middle of making my own like little universe of mm-hmm. superhero characters. So I found a way to tie Hot Dogger into Floridians. There's another comic that I'm not going to start on this year, um, but I have a, uh, like a Tampa based, uh, let's just call him a vampire for the moment because uh, that feels appropriate for Tampa. And that'll tie in at, in some way. And uh, there'll be other things here and there. But so I'll be concurrently drawing Hot Dogger and Floridians moving forward for as long as I'm interested in doing it, which should be a long time because I have a lot, too many ideas for both of those books at this point. So what, okay. So let's, let me ask a first, another question that I, well, I've been meaning to ask you, even though I know the answer to it, favorite X-Men Cyclops Cyclops. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. I think this is one of those things where when you go through the creative process, like I'm, I'm always intrigued, especially with, cause obviously like I doodle cause I'm no artist. So I doodle my ideas as well. Like I, I, I can visually see it. I may not have the skill for it, but I doodle it. When and and it sounds like one of the your note section sounds like it's like a ma- a, a major area for script wise, but when it comes to like design and like do you have like a sketch pad? Are you doing everything through your iPad or how is all that going? Is that, or do you have sometimes where if you're driving you're kind of like I'm just gonna like do a quick note of like you know an orange guy with a mask and this and that you know what I mean? Like do you are you doing like something like that sometimes? Um. So, yeah, I would say the majority of my, like, the creation stuff is it's done in the moment on the page, like, when I'm drawing it. Like, I didn't really think too far ahead of, like, what the characters would look like or what their uniforms looked like. Um, I just kind of wanted to be inspired in that moment. I There is something to be said about overthinking a lot of these things. And again, I want them to be really fun and dumb and, you know, not super serious. So the idea of like, you know, months of design work and trying to figure out what these characters look like front, back and center. It's like, no, I can figure that out on the page. And uh, some of that comes from, you know, having to think on my feet for T1 flats and Jeremiah's right. Like, there's you start and you can't stop until you're done essentially. So I'm like, I'll just, I'll figure that out. So, but a lot of, a a lot of note taking, a lot of note taking, just probably honestly too much note taking. Like, uh, uh, yeah, here's some characters, here's some ideas. And then what I'll do is like, I'll kind of pick, uh, 
the ideas and put them in order and be like, okay, that's a story. I got, I got one there, you know, like I'm not really thinking of plots necessarily, but I'm thinking of funny scenes and then just piecing those together like a puzzle. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's really how the Floridians kind of came together. How hot tiger came together. Very near mint was a lot more like sitting down and hammering out like a script. Um, not to say that I haven't done that for Floridians or for Hot Dogger. I certainly have. Uh, and uh, uh, I just finished the script for Hot Dogger number two, flying from uh, Texas to uh, back home, doing a, like my, one of my last Jeremiah's murals. So, you know, I need the script because I need something to draw on. I've learned the hard way with volume three and very near mint. I tried to draw it without a script. I had it all in my head. And then I wrote myself into a horrible corner and then like stopped production for four or five months or something oh, wow. like that because I didn't know how to get myself out of the corner. I drew myself into literally drew myself into a corner. And uh, I was like, okay, uh, never again. Like Aaron, my wife will never let me work on a comic without at least some sort of bare bones script, even if it's just page one one character does this page two character does this if it has to have i have to have something that i'm Some looking direction at. Yeah, i have to have a roadmap a little bit at least um but yeah i'm not i'm honestly i'm i don't really sketch that much i don't sketch that much i you know having drawn literally almost every day since i was two years old and especially when you're in college and then you get out of college and then you get this muraling job and you're just i mean you talk about the ten thousand hours that people need to be like pros at something i have that times probably 10,000, right? Like, so I'm not trying to hone my skills necessarily by sketching or whatever. If I am sketching, it's probably to relax and to like, you know, take the edge off or something. Uh, I'm not like drawing characters. I don't, my iPad is not full of unseen artwork. It's, okay. it's full of unseen random lines. I draw a lot of squared fingered hands, a lot of, uh, eyeballs like i'll draw eyes a lot hands a lot maybe i'll I like i'll draw like pieces of people just like okay how do i draw like a arm like that uh, but it's all mindless it's yeah. mindless i'm just turning my brain off and doing it automatically that's interesting and then yeah. do you go back I, i'm always intrigued by the whole that whole aspect because like i have like i'm kind of scattered everywhere like i have notebooks where i'll like i'll hand write stuff i have i do have a note section that has all my ideas um, and then occasionally I'll, I, it's, it gets interesting cause sometimes I'll even go. And then sometimes because of the fact that since I'm not artistic, I'll, I'll, we'll do some doodles and I'll take a picture of it yeah. and put it on like a Google keep or something. Sure. Um, and so I'm always trying to figure out like how people kind of maintain all those things, uh, so they can kind of, cause you know, it's like, it's all over the place. Yeah, it's all scattered. It, it really is. What? It, it is. Uh, I think one of my wife's probably biggest pet peeves that I, I haven't done it in a long time because I really I'm trying to be more. Uh, it's like the death knell for an artist to be more like organized yeah. and be less chaotic. But my favorite thing would be to just sketch on junk mail. Like, you know, she'll be making dinner or we'll be sitting around at the table or something. And I'll just pull like, all right, here's another credit card offer. And I just have a magic marker or Sharpie or whatever. And I'm just sketching on the back of this stuff. And, you know, okay, great. Uh, maybe uh, that's a funny face. So I'll take a photo of it yep. or I have some ideas. and I'll, I'll jot the notes down for that. Um, I haven't really done that in a long time, mainly because I've been trying to be conscious about just immediately throwing away the junk mail so it doesn't yeah. pile up on the table. Yep. So yeah, on my iPad, uh, and th th this will be for the creatives, I use a iPad Pro. I don't use a Wacom or a Wacom, however you want to say it. Uh, I used to have a Cintiq, uh, moved away from that when the iPad Pro came out uh, so much to me, I, I love it. I wasn't really drawing anything bigger than the size of the iPad Pro anyway. Like, I actually bought the iPad Pro and put it on top of the, the Cintiq. And I was like, this is the exact same space I'm using on the Cintiq. The Cintiq takes up five times space on my desk. I'll just have the iPad. Like, I'll just use the iPad. So I've moved completely to working digitally on the iPad. And uh, I use um, GoodNotes uh, to jot down a lot of ideas. Good and, um, uh, you know, if I'm... I do think it's, I find it sometimes easier to write instead of type sometimes, uh, especially if I'm trying to get an idea out. Um, and obviously, like we said, the, the notes app, a lot of dictation in that. And then I'm using, um, cell text. Uh, it's a, now it's a web app, uh, for script writing. Like, uh, essentially I'm just using like a TV script writing program to make the comics. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, that's that. It's so interesting. I I find it to be so fun. It's such a, it, it's it's definitely obviously a lot of work. So it's like one of those where I appreciate when you do release it because, uh, and then it also makes you realize and be amazed by how like you know Marvel and other comic, uh, how regular comics get released, how they're getting released almost like every two weeks. Well, getting a new yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, you know, they have entire teams, right? Correct. They, they writer, penciler, inker, colorist, letterer, yep. editor, and. Yeah, it's like, you know, people are like, well, when's the next book coming out? It's like, I'm one guy. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have a day job. I have yeah. a wife. I travel. I have to Hawaii. a life. I have, I have a life. I travel to Hawaii too much. I drink too many tiki drinks. Like, I can't pump out a comic every month. If I didn't have a day job, best case scenario, bet like in my, like, what could I do? I could probably do a comic a month by myself. Yeah. I'm fast enough to do it. I would need a few month lead in. So I wouldn't be constantly like the minute one's done. I have to work on the next one. I, you know, if I had a little bit of a buffer buffer, had some books in the bank, I, I have thought. And at some point I will, I'm, I'm going to just put this out into the world. Give it to me. Uh, I will do a monthly Patreon comic thing. Okay. Uh, it won't be obviously this year or next year because um, I'm have another. I, there's another another book I'm going to work on a graphic novel, like an all ages graphic novel that I'm going to work on towards the end of the year, uh, along with Floridians number two, Hot Dog number two, and then this very near Mint one shot. Uh, but so maybe. Would maybe it, I can be a, for like would it be 20, like a digital would it be like a digital Patreon? no it would be it would be like a i want it to be a physical comic patreon nice. like i mean obviously there'd be a tier for like the digital comics like a pdf or whatever um but i would love to really challenge myself to do like a monthly book i mean it is harder to do it by yourself but if i have a bunch of lead time where i have everything written and legitimately the only thing I need to do is draw it and get it printed. I could probably enlist my wife to help me with some of the lettering aspects. Although the lettering, unlike what they do in comics where they do the lettering after the fact, after the art's made, I'm doing the lettering. It's all integrated as pieces mm -hmm. of the art as the page is being correct, uh, created. So I wouldn't do full color because that's too costly, obviously, yeah. and too time consuming. So black and white comics, which I already do, if I could have a six to eight month lead, I could probably starting in 2025, I could probably release a book every month on Patreon. And uh, yeah, you could get you could have like my little uh, subscription service. That's, That's what I would love to do. I by no means am I going. Do I think I can? I, can I do it? Yes. Will I do it? Let's we'll see. Let's see what the world looks like next year. Yeah, for sure. Um, you brought it up, and I'm gonna. And that was perfect transition for me because I. I love your, you mentioned Hawaii quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I know you have a tiki bar. You have like a, a fascination with the tiki culture. Uh, I want to, I kind of, I want to talk, listen, get a little bit of an idea of where that comes from. Sure. Um, and then also what it's led to uh, your newest opportunity that yeah. you get creative director. Yep. Uh, so I kind of want to, I kind of wanted to get a little bit of a story on that. Um, you know, growing up down in Fort Myers in Cape Coral, specifically Cape Coral, uh, a lot of mid-century modern architecture down there. The city was really invented in the 50s. So a lot of these, you know, ranch style houses. I mean, you're sitting inside my house. This house here uh, uh, near Winter Garden was built in 1954. And uh, so my wife and I love mid-century modern aesthetics. Um, you know, she kind of has for she dresses in that sort of way. Yep. I wear a lot of Hawaiian shirts and we just have you know the 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 vibe right not necessarily the era but the vibes of the era the Correct. way it looked so i grew up loving that she grew up loving that stuff and um you know i went to college in fort lauderdale so the mai kai is like one of the oldest tiki bars in the country i drove by it i'm ashamed to say that i never went inside it when i was in college uh, i drove by it a ton of times it would be really it would be so much cred to say that i like went into it in the year 2000 yeah. but i don't want to lie about it i drove by it i was intrigued by it i uh you know wanted to go in but i think my friends were probably afraid and to be fair it's kind of a scary looking place from the outside if you don't know what's inside of it uh so had some fascination and then you know when you're traveling around you sort of grow up and you're getting out of drinking like 
Bud Light or Miller Light or Coors Light or whatever, and you're like, mm, what's a cocktail? Like, yeah. let me have something you know fun. And then you start seeing like, all right, I'm gonna let me try. What's the zombie? Like, what what's this drink on this menu? And they're like, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna it's pretty strong. It's like, okay, sure, whatever, man. You know, I uh, I drink uh, Natty Light. You don't need to worry about strong. <laughs> I'm, I can take care of myself. Uh, and so you get introduced to the cocktail. So that was really sort of my probably my first foray into uh like tiki culture uh cocktails uh which are a big part of the tiki world for sure and then um when uh we had the opportunity to go to hawaii uh we landed in oahu at night so i couldn't really see what was going on and woke up the next morning opened up the blinds and i mean like it's not a lie to say that there was the version of me before I open up the blinds there and the version of me since I opened up the blinds looking out into Oahu into this paradise and um, yeah it completely changed me in so many ways I mean we, I got engaged on that trip so I mean my life changed but the the culture of Hawaii the culture of the you know these Pacific Islands really just resonated with me in so many different ways and then I was like wait a minute is this what tiki bars are based on back home like so you start finding out like the history of how tiki came to be which was really invented by sailors coming back from world war ii specifically the pacific who were looking for escapism right they spent all their downtime in the pacific uh looking out to these hawaiian or not 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 necessarily hawaiian islands but some of them were stationed out there in the hawaiian islands but pacific islands looking out of palm trees and they had access or uh, uh, uh they were uh, fruits exotic fruits were available to them they were making stuff called torpedo juice on the decks of their ships because sailors had uh, a bunch of time a bunch of fruit yeah. And a bunch of essentially ethanol gasoline that torpedoes were using that uh, fermented on the front of a ship inside an oil can makes essentially moonshine after a couple of days. And they were getting blackout drunk. And that's where the term torpedo juice comes from. If you've ever had, a, if we went to a college party, like the tor- term torpedo juice came from sailors making uh, alcohol on the, on the decks of their ships. So fell down the rabbit hole really hard, right? Like, uh, fell in love with Hawaii, fell in love with tiki culture, not necessarily the, um, didn't fall. I'm not the cultural appropriation stuff is obviously problematic. And, you know, at the bar that we build at our house really strays away from any like tiki's specifically, um, more again, vibes, right? Like we have a ton of tiki mugs and they're from, places that we've visited from mug makers that we love stuff that reminds us of trips to wherever we've gone and um the culture of the not culture is maybe the wrong word but the community around these tiki the the bars and the people in the community uh the it's just a great group of people and um completely changed my life literally going to hawaii changed my life in so many different ways and uh so yeah then during the pandemic uh i got laid off from my day job and i had nothing to do and we bought this house and we bought it specifically because the back room was an a-frame and uh we knew that that would make a fantastic tiki bar so we wanted to we knew we couldn't go to hawaii for a little while so we wanted to bring hawaii to us so our our tiki bar is less tiki and more uh i would say like hawaiian esque yeah Yeah, we're just trying to kind of capture some of those mid-century modern aesthetics from uh the lounges and uh, the hotels in, in waikiki and oahu and uh just wanted to have like this laid back escapism uh, vibe when the world is legitimately falling apart around yeah. you uh so everyone else is freaking out but i was sitting in my house making my ties that's and then how did that lead to your current your your current opportunity that you've yeah yeah it's it's a that's a well, that's a weird story too so i mean obviously you know you get into the culture you get into the community and then you know um naturally i want to start doing some you know uh pinup artwork with like you know girls wearing some like you know cool aloha wear or whatever and that opens up some more opportunities and eventually i worked for 
and work for again a company in Tampa called 23 Restaurant Services. They we are the uh, official licensee of Ford Motor Company for Ford's Garage. Uh, we have another concept, which is a British theme restaurant. So I worked for this company for a long time after Tijuana Flats before Jeremiah's. And um, they were starting to build out a tiki bar concept while I was there. Not really necessarily my vibe. It's more like Florida tiki, which is its own thing. And we, if we had five more hours on this podcast, I could explain I the feel difference. Like, I feel like you're going to have like a tiki uh, tiki podcast. Oh, I should have. I mean, there's tiki podcast, but I mean, I, I should probably have one too at yeah. this point. But yeah, there's so many variations on what people consider tiki. So I wasn't necessarily all the way. In v- I, I I got laid off right when this thing was kind of taking off. So because COVID happened, so I wasn't heavily involved with it. So I didn't have a heavy hand leading the charge. And um, then I got the job with Jeremiah's and just kind of put 23 restaurant services in my back window. And uh, when I was doing out of Jer or when I was working for Jeremiah's, I had the opportunity to be in a ton of different cities. So I was checking out legitimately every tiki bar that I could go to that I had time to go to. And uh, I got a call last uh, summer, like I would say June or July or something like that, from the owner of 23 Restaurant Services. And he calls, his name's Mark, and uh, what's up, Mark? And uh, he's not listening. <laughs> uh, he, Mark, my boss, calls me and uh, he's like, have you heard of Don the Beachcomber? And I was like, well, yeah, I've heard of Don the Beachcomber. And for a little context of what, what, on the beachcomber is that was the first tiki bar it's a proto tiki bar it existed prior to tiki it was invented in 1932 by a man named don beach and uh spoiler alert that's not his real name uh he uh (laughs) that's good to know don beach created don the beachcomber cafe and then when pre when prohibition ended he legitimately like almost overnight turned his bar or turned his cafe into into the very first tiki bar in 1933. And he is the man who's responsible for creating drinks such as the zombie, uh, the missionary's downfall, uh, Navy grog, three dots and a dash. Essentially this guy is, is as important to American culture as Henry Ford is in a lot of ways. I mean, very similar, not similar stories, but when you think about Henry Ford inventing the, you know, the assembly line, when Henry Ford invented the assembly line, Don Beach was inventing cocktail culture in this country. And um, he opened up a number of restaurants and bars across the country uh, over the years. He fell into some weird times. There's some mob stuff that he got involved with, maybe in Chicago, some wife stuff, maybe lost the ability to open up the restaurants on the mainland. So then he went out to Hawaii. And um, if you've ever been to Oahu, the International Marketplace, which is in downtown Waikiki, like smack dab in the heart of Waikiki, was created by Don Beach, the man who made Don the Beachcomber, and he put a Don the Beachcomber in the heart of Waikiki. And uh, Tiki really fell out of, um, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't cool anymore in the 70s and the 80s when it, it was it was our grandparents thing. And when our parents were young in the 70s and then the disco and stuff, their parents stuff wasn't cool anymore. So it kind of fell into disarray and then finally went out of business um, like 2017, 2018. So then Mark, yeah, he calls me. He's like, do you know about Don the Beachcomber? And I said, of course I do. And he goes, what would you say if I was able to get my hands on it? I'd say, I told him, I was like, I'll eat my shoe. I'll eat my shoe in front of you. If you can get your hands on that brand, I'll eat my shoe. Like there are so many people in the community, in the tiki world, uh, carvers, bar tent, bar owners, uh, you know, just important folks who have tried and 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 failed. They have not succeeded to get this uh, company out of the woman's hands who owned it. So he went, he flew out there, had a conversation, calls me a couple days later. He's like, I think it's going to happen. I was like, okay. And he's like, if I get it, you're coming back, right? And I was like. Again, I'll eat my shoe and I'll come back. I'll eat bull shoes at this point. Like, whatever. Like, you're telling me that there's an opportunity to work on this piece of American history that is so lost to so many people that we can bring it back to some level of prominence. Like, why wouldn't I jump that opportunity? So, got the deal done. He got the deal done. He did it. We own it. Like, and uh, then, um, yeah, he invited me back to the company. 
I am now the creative director for 23 Restaurant Services, but specifically my focus is on Don the Beachcomber. And now I'm proud to say that we are in the process of opening not one or two or three, but probably 50 locations over the next five to 10 years. I mean, 50 might be over saturation. Certainly there's going to be a lot. There will be a lot. And that'll be in the Southeast or it's going to be kind of all over the place. First, it'll be in Florida and then we'll eventually expand. I mean, obviously our um, operation is based out of Tampa. So there's some limitations as to, you know, we have to ramp up before we can bring Don the Beachcomber back to California, right? Like it started in California and in, uh, in Hollywood in the thirties and everyone wants it back. And I want it back there too. I want it in Oahu and I want it in Chicago and New York. And I want it in Atlanta. I want it. Every major city should have it on the beach comer and we'll hopefully fingers crossed get there for the time being. It will be a Florida based brand uh, to get off the ground and get our feet wet with it. Because truthfully, a lot of the people who work in our company aren't that adverse to Tiki culture. Uh, so that's why I came back on board to kind of help them guide them. And thankfully we've also put together a advisory board, uh, that will help guide and, um, you know, make sure that we're doing everything correctly, that we're not overstepping, that we're not, um, you know, being we're not appropriating anything that yeah. that we're staying true to what this man don beach invented and also you know really taking it into the uh, future so i'm very excited about the opportunity that i have and there's a lot of work ahead of us and uh, uh i'm trying not to freak out about it honestly honestly I'm, I'm sorry that was so long-winded no dude i'm very excited for you on this because when i saw that it was like man i'm like Talk about getting to a point where, and in many cases, and then correct me if I'm wrong, obviously they, they have history with you, but a lot of that also is the fact that you, it's a culmination of what you've done through your career. Yeah. That um, everything from where the work that you've done when you, you know, and how it's all progressed and then being able to see the work and then, because obviously if you were doing other things like in other organ, you know, obviously no one would have known if you weren't posting stuff about your 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 fascination with tiki culture and, sure. and all of that yeah. and uh, and your artwork and all those things and they wouldn't have even known any of that stuff uh and it's kind of just kind of progressed now to this uh where you are right now yeah it's interesting you know when i got the job with tijuana flats it was never my intention of ever working in the restaurant industry you know like i i wanted to be an animator i wanted to be a comic book artist and i mean something we didn't touch on is i actually got to work for mad magazine for about six years which i was, was gonna i was gonna bring that okay, up as well, well we, but, we, can come, yeah. we can come back to that and that also ties into like mid-century modern stuff right like that was popular in the 50s and the 60s and got to work on like this uh piece of american comedy you know uh it as is for comedy mad magazine belongs on the mount rushmore of comedy right yeah. like it should just be alfred e newman up there on on the mount rushmore of comedy because it's so important to so many comics and comedians and writers anyway uh to answer your question you know i didn't want to work in restaurants i worked in a restaurant for a week in high school between jobs like i got fired from best buy and then uh, i needed a job to get me through the rest of high school before uh summer break so i worked i tried a restaurant hated it and that was my only experience ever working in a restaurant just one week at a perkins in cape coral and it was horrible awful so when tijuana flats came around i was like okay i'm not really working in the restaurant but i'm part of the restaurant culture i guess and over those you know eight nine years that i was with tijuana flats Essentially, what I was doing was creating immersive experiences for guests, right? So um, I wasn't necessarily making the food, but I am having like, you know, a hand in what the guests experience is walking into this restaurant. And when I got the job with 23 Restaurant Services, it was because uh, the marketing woman at that time walked into a Tijuana Flats in South Tampa and saw my work. And for they wanted some paintings of British uh, like icons for this British themed restaurant that they were building in downtown uh, Tampa. So I did those paintings. And then after I got done with those paintings, she looked at me and she's like, well, what else can you do? 
I was like, well, I, you know, I can do graphic design and stuff. So now I'm working for a restaurant company, not in the restaurant, but like it's, it's still cr- helping shape the customer experience inside the restaurant with menu design, with decor design, with just sort of j- vibes, right? Like that's so having that experience and then unfortunately being laid off. I mean, look, I it's it sucked at the time and I totally understood why I was the first guy laid off during COVID. The last thing anyone needs when no one's going in the restaurants is art guy. Right. So then I got to do Jeremiah's and again, even I had an even bigger hand than I had at Tijuana flats, kind of creating these immersive experiences for, for the guests. So that along with my interest in Tiki, my interest in mid century, modern stuff with, uh, you know, it is weird how it all just kind of like folded onto itself. And now I have a very heavy hand in not just, Oh yeah. Justin's going to make some menus for this, you know, bar it's no, Justin is helping literally direct what the look and feel of the entire place is going to be. So yeah, no, it's, it's weird. Uh, You know, uh, I, I still, if you ask me what my job is, I think I would still say comic book artist. I don't think I would say that I I, uh, work in a restaurant company. I, in my head, uh, you know, my, my childhood heart tells me that I'm a comic book artist, but truly I'm, you know, I am a creative director for a restaurant group and I am uh, essentially going to be an M in charge of creating these immersive experiences, one of a kind experiences for guests, not something I take lightly at all. And, uh, I guess I need to stop calling myself a comic book artist. I'm a, I'm a comic book hobbyist. I'm a comic book artist hobbyist. I mean, and on the, you the, are still making comics. I'm still making comics. And you know, that's the nice thing where I, I'm able to work on the comics, like, you know, evenings and weekends and kind of chip away at it when I have the, the time, the free time to do it. But yeah, my entire, like all my creative, a lot of my creative energy, most of my creative energy, honestly, is being put towards Towards these restaurants and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way like they've trusted me with it and uh, uh, it's not a uh, something I take lightly at all no that's awesome dude that's uh, it's super super cool I I was super excited when I saw that um, just because I uh, the fact of the love that you have for it and what and the opportunity that it brings so it's a uh, definitely an amazing opportunity I got to I've already designed my first tiki mug and uh, it's gonna be it's the people that we have on the advisory board are some of the heavy hitters in the Tiki community. And when I presented it to them, I mean, I was sweating, I was sweating. Like I was so nervous to show these guys who I admire, whose art I have on my walls, whose mugs I have bought and stood in line for to show them what I've done. And they turn to me and they say, I don't, I don't buy mugs because I make mugs. I don't need to buy mugs, but I would buy that mug and I'm going to buy that mug. I want that mug like they were it was that was one of the cooler experiences I've ever had having these people that I look up to tell me that like no man you this you're doing you're here you belong I love it dude I love it I do have one last question I have one last question and then and then you can tell people where they can follow you is what advice would you give someone for wanting to start something do it Honestly, do it like, you know, talking to young artists at comic conventions and I just met with some friends, uh, a friend and, you know, she was having a hard time trying to figure out what she wanted to do or even how to start doing it. And the the best advice I have is to literally just start like no one can start for you, right? No one's going to be able to start it for you. There'll be people who can help you along the way, but you're the one who has to get the engine on and going and rolling down the hill at the very least. Um, the hardest part is starting. Once you're started, you know, once you have that momentum, it really, I wouldn't, it's not, it's never easy, right? There, it, sometimes there'll be parts that are easy. There's going to be parts that are hard. And the parts that were easy the last time might be really hard for you this time. It's the, honestly, just putting pen to paper, putting your hands on the keyboard and starting to type. Put it, make forcing yourself through that process, even when you hate it. Com- getting to the end of that process, if you're writing a script or if you're sketching out a character, finish it. It might be the worst thing you've ever done, and you might not want to ever show it to somebody, but you did it. 
and you you're going to learn something from that process that will help you later on and um yeah like people ask me all the time especially young artists like how do you make comics and i just say i start I start, I start, I start drawing it. Like that's, there's no, there's no shortcuts, man. Like, I mean, I wish there were, and I know that people look at creative people and they see like, Oh, it's the computer doing it for you. It's like, no man, it's still me. Like I, I'm living in my head. They're my ideas. I got to get them out of my head and on out into the world in some way. And, um, how do I do it? Well, just do it. I mean, there's, but there's no right way and there's no wrong way. Um, there's your way. And however that looks for you, that's my biggest advice. Like, uh, put your put down the video games. Uh, you know, stop watching TV, and maybe once a week, if you can spare once a week, if you can spare more than once a week, start working on something. And then you'll look up, and you'll have a you know treasure trove of stuff that you didn't have before. But you got to start that's my biggest advice that's that's a that's a great one how can people follow you and support you check out uh especially if they wanted to buy uh very near mint the hot dogger the unbelievable floridians what are how can they uh can they check all that stuff out i've got that stuff and i got also stickers available in my web shop you can get to all that stuff on my instagram it's just at justin peterson p-e-t-e-r-s-o-n and then justin obviously spelt normally too traditional justin Tr- traditional that's justin what I, that's what i traditional call it. justin and then peterson <laughs> son yes um well justin thank you so much for being on oh, i really dude, i really appreciate we finally it. did it i know it's been a while two years of you begging me to be on here and I'm, I know, we're here i know we're doing what, it what are you gonna do hey you know i gotta be i gotta be persistent this yeah. is what i wanted well um but that's our show that's our show for today thank you so much for justin for being on thanks for having me for man. having uh having lunch with me definitely go check out uh, you know, hey, if you if you haven't read comics in a while, I definitely recommend reading Very Near Mint. Um, definitely check out the the new comics that he has. Hot Dogger and Floridians were definitely those are more uh, friendly to people who aren't familiar with comics. Yes. Very Near Mint is very '90s comics. Uh, heavy-handed like pop culture references. Yes, but Floridians, if you're a Floridian and you're listening to this by the floridians because y- you know you know the people that are in the comic yes you will you will appreciate it definitely make sure to check it out um if you enjoyed the show definitely check out uh you know subscribe share tell all your friends um if you want to support my brand check out deli fresh shreds and do some shopping uh thank you until next time keep eating sandwiches and follow your passion thanks everyone <laughs>